Courtney Bird. I'm the president of, of FalmouthNet. Uh, this has been a um, three plus a year journey and we are here. It's not a journey that's over. In a sense, we're kind of right in the beginning of it. And it wouldn't be possible except for the hard work of a lot of people who gave of their time. David Eisenberg and Mark Gaylord and Dan Gesson and Ed Schwartz and Mary Louise Snowman, uh, Jason Cullinane and some other ones, if I hope I haven't missed anybody. But um, we, we did, did this because we felt it was important for the community of Falmouth. And um, as I say, we're not done. And we're here because of the efforts of our, um, of, of our state legislators, like, Mary Lo um, like Sue Moran, like David Vieira, uh, Dylan Fernandez, and a lot of other people. Uh, Steve Johnson of Open Cape, and others that I could name forever, or some of our selectmen like Sam and, and uh, Doug who are happening to sit here. It wouldn't be possible without their support, and it wouldn't have been possible without the support of this, of this uh, community. And I forgot Mary uh, Harris who just joined our board. Um, so we're here. And um, the purpose of this meeting is to make a presentation about the high-level engineering design study done by Tilson Engineering out of Portland, Maine. And um, this was a vital step. It's like drawing architectural plans uh, for building a building. It's beyond concept. It's going to help the future Municipal uh, Light Board and, and MLP Municipal Light Plant. It's going to help the selectmen, the town administration, and the town meeting members, and the community as a whole to get us one more step and understand the costs and all of that. And that's, that's the step, that's the context of this meeting. And we hope in the future to hold other meetings to uh, um, inform you about other aspects of this. So this is just one step in the, prog in the process. So I've talked enough, because if I talk any longer, somebody in the, uh, my, my uh, board of trustees will give me the hook. So I'm gonna turn this meeting over to David Eisenberg. David is, uh, David is uh, very knowledgeable. He's um, at one point worked with the FCC uh, in Washington as a senior advisor on uh, national broadband policy during the Obama administration. And he knows more than, about this than I do or even dreamed of doing. And then the other person that will help out on this is Art Gaylord. And Art um, is, was senior, was, a, um, was uh, head of the IT department at Woods Hole Oceanographic. He was one of the founders of Open Cape. He's been intimately involved in the creation of other fiber optic networks in uh, Massachusetts and elsewhere. And that's the kind of high level brain power that has gone to work on this uh, project and is one of the reasons why it's a success. So David, if you could uh, come up and, and uh, take over and uh, fill folks in on, on what's gonna happen before we hear from uh, Chris and Tilson. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks out there in uh, FCTV land for, for tuning in and thanks to FCTV for producing this. Um, the network design that you're going to hear about tonight was commissioned by FalmouthNet, the nonprofit that uh, Courtney and Art and I and, and the rest of the people Courtney mentioned formed in 2020. And um, uh, it was executed by Tilson. Uh, the field engineer who did the work is here, Chris Belt. The goal of our study was to learn more about the details of building a network for Falmouth's future so we could make good technology choices and choose the right partners to build and operate our network. A network design is like the architectural drawings for a house. 
you don't have to have them. You can just hire a home builder and say three bedrooms and trust that they'll build a good house. But if you do have drawings, you can use these drawings to count up the two by sixes, the sheets of plywood, and the squares of roofing uh, shingles, and you can take the drawings to different builders and communicate basically the same thing and be confident that they'll have a common understanding. You can also take a set of architectural drawings to the bank to support applying for uh, money to build your house. So the first step towards this network design was to publish a request for proposals, an RFP, describing the network that we'd like to build in very general terms, so the firms that do this kind of work would know what, what to respond to. We got a wide variety of responses, but Tilson's response really impressed us. It was head and shoulders better than the other bidders. Tilson had more expertise and experience. It offered more engineering field work. It had better geographical mapping software. And it was headquartered here in New England, right up the road in Portland, Maine. So the choice was actually quite easy. And we think that the work that they're going to present tonight is, will validate our initial impressions. As Courtney mentioned, we'd like to thank uh, Senator Sue Moran, Representatives uh, Dylan Fernandez and David Vieira for supporting this work with a $150,000 line item in the state budget last year. Now, I'm guessing, just using my intuition, that there's two big questions on everyone's mind. The first one is, how much is this darn thing going to cost? And the second one is, how are we going to get the money to build it? The first one is easier to answer. Our 2020 feasibility study, funded by the EDIC, and we thank the EDIC for, for that uh, initiative, um, as that, that's, that feasibility study estimated $55 million. Tilson's work generally confirms that figure and presents a few alternative technology choices that would change the figure, a million here and a million there. Of course, um, uh, and uh, I'm, I just bit my tongue what I was going to ad lib was about a million here and a million there, and you're talking about real money, but uh, I missed my calling as a stand-up comedian. Um, so the, the other factor when we did the feasibility study, inflation was 2 or 3%. Now it's 8%. So there's a huge fudge factor that's related to the time between now and when we actually build it that will affect the ultimate cost. Question two, where are we going to get the money, is harder to answer tonight. Fortunately, we don't have to make that decision. That decision will be made by the Municipal Light Board, the five-member Municipal Light Board, that our town will elect in November. As we consider these questions, let us remember the difference between an investment and an expense. The fiber optic network that we are planning is an investment. In contrast, the tens of millions of dollars that Falmouth's current internet users send over the bridge to national providers every year, tens of millions of dollars that we send over the bridge every year, that's an expense. Let's also remember the difference between consumers and citizens. Consumers are defined by transactions to get what they want. Citizens, on the other hand, are defined by deliberating on the collective destiny of their community as a whole. Falmouth's network is an exercise in citizenship. If the people of Falmouth know as much about this network as possible, it will be a better network. 
It'll be a stronger contributor to our town, technically, operationally, and financially. So please consider tonight's presentation an invitation to participate. The network design is on the Falmouth Net website. It's accessible to all of you. Please dive in, look at it as closely as you wish. Dive into the, also we invite you to dive into the federal, state, and private funding opportunities that uh, lots of people are talking about that will uh, present themselves and help us figure out what to apply for, in what mix, under what terms. We need your vision, your skepticism, your questions, your concerns, so we can, if nothing else, catch mistakes and oversights before they become a big expense to our town. In the end, this will be our network, Falmouth's network, and investment in Falmouth's future. Now, the presentation you're about to hear is a little bit technical. Please don't tune out if you don't understand it all. If you're thinking, huh? That means you have a question. Ask it, please, please. If, you're, if you get lost, let us know you're lost. We'll, we'll, we, we want you to know as much as possible about this, and we're still learning. So we invite you to come learn with us. Now I'd like to turn the program over to Chris Belt, Tilson's lead engineer on uh, Falmouth's network design. He's done some incredible work over the last, mostly in January, December, it was, December really. And January. December and January. Anyway, Chris Belt from Tilson, everybody. <clears throat> <laughs> Uh, good evening. My name is Chris Belt, and I want to thank you for having myself and my colleagues from Tilson take part in your Falmouth Net public information meeting. Uh, Tilson Technology, like they stated, is based in Portland, Maine, and we have offices all across the country. Um, what we do is we build America's information infrastructure. Um, I have two colleagues on line here that I'd like to introduce real quick. Um, Peter Robbins, uh, he was our project manager. Uh, he's been managing this project. Um, since the, we kicked it off last year. Uh, Peter, if you'd like to. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. I am the uh, disembodied voice speaking from the speakers right now. Thank you. And uh, my other uh, colleague is Scott Madison, who is the director of our due diligence um, organization and has worked closely with the team to help summarize and analyze the data to generate the final report. Scott. Good evening, every, good evening, everybody. Okay, the scope of this project uh, was basically to do a site survey, provide a high level design, uh, provide some technology comparisons and give you some cost estimates. Uh, tonight we will provide you with our findings and our recommendations. The site survey, I can speak very well about this. I spent many days here. I brought a crew back out. Um, we were here in December and January. Uh, we spent approximately 46 days. Um, we put in like say 300 hours and we actually did drive 1200 miles out. Um, we actually uh, are very organized when we go to the field. We have trackers on each one of our uh, engineers that are in the field so that we make sure we hit every street and that uh, we don't overlap each other. So we're very thorough in making sure that we cover that. We did look at approximately 11,000 polls. Uh, we tried to pull out and, and identify the worst of the worst uh, so that we could give a better understanding of what the infrastructure is here in Falmouth. Um, the results from the site survey, um, you can see the yellow uh, pin drops on the map. Those are the polls that we've identified. And that's approximately 1,021 polls that have potential make ready issues. Now, what we mean by make ready is you want to go out and you want to attach to that poll. We go out, we look at the poll, and there could be multiple carriers on that poll. There could be secondary uh, power on that poll, primary power on there, or it could be all of the above. 
we have to find room on that pole. If there isn't enough room on that pole, we either have to move carriers up or down, or in some instances, you may have to replace the pole and put a bigger pole in so that you can get clearances across the roads. Um, there was 22 poles that we identified that had critical issues. Um, those poles will definitely have to be replaced. Um, and, and those could be poles that have cracks in them or are leaning over too far that can't be uh, brought back. Um, and then we also identified approximately 46 locations that we would consider maybe doing underground instead of doing uh, pole attachments and make ready on those poles. And what we mean by that, there were some streets that we, what we looked at is the pole conditions and the poles were very, they were short poles and they were loaded with a lot of uh, um, other carriers on those particular poles. So the cost of trying to replace all those poles because they kept crisscrossing back and forth the road would probably be more expensive than for us to potentially go underground and trench it and bypass all those poles. In the long term of that, by doing that, we also don't have to incur pole attachment fees every year. Um, we look at make ready costs and those average from about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars per mile for aerial fiber. Uh, and, and what that means is there's some streets where I, I noticed when I was here up in the the west Falmouth up at the northern end there, there were several streets that had all brand new poles on. They were very large poles and there was plenty of room, so there really isn't any make ready with those poles. They're, they're ready to be attached to. But in other locations, there's going to be more work. So that's where it averages out. So in your neighborhood, you might be all good. In somebody else's neighborhood, it may need a lot of work. And that, like I say, that's how we average it out. Um, some of the poles may re be required to be repaired um, by the owners. Um, all poles have to be uh, NESC compliant, and that's the National Electric Safety Code. Um, and, and again, those poles, uh, they would be required to uh, maintain those poles. Okay, what we have here is, um, this is the town of Falmouth, where the green fiber is where we would recommend aerial fiber. And there's about 280 miles of that, or 74% of your town would be, um, have aerial plant. The orange fiber is where we would recommend going underground, uh, and that's about 97 miles worth of plant. Um, you have about 26% of that being underground. So it's not a bad um, uh, percentage there. Now, in this area here, what we're looking at is, and again, this is a high level design. So what we're looking at is you have a central office and then you're looking at the blue little dots are what we call remotes. In those remotes, that's where your transport equipment would be and your equipment, your electronics that would feed out to the residential homes. Now, let me break this down a little bit more. The red line going around connecting all of that would be what's called a self-healing fiber ring. And that's what your transport portion of the network is all connected to. So, Let's say I go out, I'm a homeowner, I decide to buy a backhoe because I always wanted one, I want to go out in my yard and dig. Well, you know, what do I know? I just go out and start digging because I'm having fun. Well, you've got fiber there, I dig it up. Okay, I break the fiber. Nobody loses service because where I do that break, the buildings on either side of that fiber will automatically loop back on themselves and the, the fiber will continue and stay up and running. Once that fiber gets re-spliced and put back in the ground, the, the ring will then go back into a complete circle. Um, again, in these remotes, what we've, we've got four here represented, and what we're looking to do is, again, you have your transport ring going around, you have your transport equipment, at each location, you hand off to what's called an OLT. It's an optical line termination unit. Those will be active devices, and those are the only active devices be on your network. As you go out from the remotes to your homes, there are no active devices on the plant. Everything is passive. So there will be no amplifiers hanging on the poles, there will be no nodes hanging on the poles, no repeaters, there will be no equipment 
uh, active equipment sitting anywhere. Um, it's a very reliable network. Uh, and, and let me get to the next slide here, and I can go into a little. Anyway, uh, stay with this one. So uh, at each house, it, you're going to have what's called an ONT installed at your house. Um, and that just plugs into an electric outlet in your basement or in your room, wherever you have your fiber come in. The fiber is going to leave the blue building. It's going to go out. There's going to be a little cabinet on the side of the road. It's going to go in there. It's going to hit an optical split, uh, splitter. It will split the fiber into multiple fibers, and those fibers will go out to each individual home. So again, because this is all a passive network, during lightning storms or any of that type of stuff, you don't have to worry about uh, outages or stuff because of it's, it's all uh, dielectric fiber, and um, it, it's not susceptible to interference and whatnot. The three technologies that we looked at um, are GPON, uh, XGS PON, and Active Ethernet. Uh, GPON is a, and XGS PON are both point to multi point, and that's where I was talking about coming from the blue building, going out to a splitter cabinet, and going out to multiple points. Um, in the GPON, you get a 2.5 gigabit downstream, you get and a 1 gigabit upstream. Uh, you can see that the XGS PON increases substantially. Uh, gives you 10 uh, uh, symmetrical. And the active knee ethernet is a point to point where there's an individual fiber coming from that blue building to every single home. So there's more fiber being installed in those locations. The passive optical networks are on a managed point to multi point technology. In the case of GPON and XGS PON, a single distribution fiber originating at that blue building goes out to a cabinet, which is usually mounted on a pole. Um, and in that cabinet, there's where the splitters are placed. Um, those splitters then attach to the fiber that's going out and feeding everyone's homes. Now, the ratio of that can be changed depending on what your needs are. Uh, the ratio of single distribution fiber to multiple feeders is anywhere from 1 by 16 to 1 by 128. Uh, a 1 by 16 means that one fiber is going out from that OLT, and it's going to go out, get to a passive splitter, and it's going to go to 16 individual homes. Uh, higher ratios result in more users sharing a finite amount of bandwidth. Um, and again, like I said, GPON is, is a 2.5 gigabit per second um, downstream and a 1 gigabit up, whereas the XGS PON is 10 by 10. Active Ethernet is also a 10 by 10. Um, act, active Ethernet also dramatically increases construction and maintenance costs and offers little, if any, benefits to the residential and small to mid-sized business user. Uh, generally, the people who use that are a small group of 10 to 20 percent, uh, and it's really, it's a, it's a lot to build for just that small percentage. Now, here is the diagram comparison. So you can see on the left, you have that active cabinet, which is that little blue dot. It's a little, little hut. Um, that's where your OLT is, your optical line termination. It's, it's one fiber, it's going to come out on a port, it's going to go out to a splitter cabinet. In this diagram, we show a 1 by 64 split, and from there it goes out to potentially 64 different homes, and they all come back and share that one fiber. On the right-hand side, you can see uh, what active Ethernet looks like. It's a little bit cleaner because you don't have any splitters or anything in the field, but in your, cab in your uh, remote, you will have uh, a lot more fibers in there that need to be terminated. Uh, fiber technology uh, comparisons, uh, the slit ratios. Um, on GPON and XGS PON technologies, they're both scalable and that the size of the split ratio can be adjusted to accommodate changes in throughput demand. Regardless of the split configuration, however, GPON inherently has insufficient bandwidth to provide full gigabit service to multiple users in today's usage environments without significant risk of network contention. 
XGS POM can be initially deployed in a 1 by 64 split configuration, reducing the cost per passing to only a modest increase over GPON, and can be easily reconfigured to lower split ratios when and if demand increases dictate additional bandwidth. The reconfiguration to a lower split ratio can be done selectively on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis as bandwidth demands uh, warrant. In each neighborhood, the ratio reduction can be deferred until bandwidth usage reaches capacity threshold, helping to divert capital until demand warrants. In a 1 by 64 XGS PON, the aggregate capacity will still be twice that of GPON in the downstream and four times the capacity in the upstream. Additionally, unlike the upgrade from GPON to XGS PON, virtually none of the initial cost in a 1 by 64 split XGS PON deployment is sunk. Conversion to a 1 by 32 split configuration can be done when demands dictate, again, deferring some of that capital cost. Cost estimates. So we've provided um, a, a chart here uh, with GPON at a 1 by 32 split, uh, XGS PON with a 1 by 32 split, and an XGS PON with a 1 by 64 split. Now, fiber and subscriber installation costs remain the same across all network types. Hub, transport, and access construction costs vary across network types and split ratios. XGS PON deployed with a 1 by 64 split ratio is less expensive, but provides more throughput than a GPON network deployed with a 1 by 32 split ratio. Um, that's the end of the presentation. Um, I guess if you guys have any questions, we are all here to answer everything you can as best we can for you. Yes. If you have a, if you, if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll bring you a mic. That's so that the people, anybody who's watching it on the F, over FCTV can, uh, can hear. Thank you. This is a sort of general question. On the 46 sites you identified as it would be preferable to go underground, would that be an opportunity for all the poles in that area to go underground with you at that time? Is that something that's uh, feasible? Probably not. Yeah, that would be, uh, you'd have to get all the utilities to agree to do that. And they're probably not going to want to spend the money. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a very informative. Uh, and I did see on my street where I do have underground services now, you did have underground on there. Uh, my question to you, the, the cost that you threw up there, did they include sort of that last 100 yards to the house, or is this just all the backbone and down the streets? Uh, so did it include the actual cost to get to, into somebody's house from the uh, right away or street? Scott, were you? Did you hear that question? Yeah, I did. So it's um, it's really all inclusive. Um, what we did was we broke out the construction cost for the for all of the distribution fiber and the backbone fiber on a per mile basis, and then we showed the um, the cost per subscriber to hook it up in using. Uh, a very similar take rate or, or uh, percentage of people that, that take the service as what was in the um, uh, the uh, um, survey that was done or the uh, 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 report that was done a couple of years, a, a year or two ago. Um, we applied that number of subscribers times the cost for installation into our cost estimate. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the subscriber line there subscriber line yes. installation is that last sort of what I call 100 feet and, and, then the electronics. and the electronics okay thank you and, and the, yes and the electronics and the, and the cost to wire it inside the house let me add that 
it, uh, this is based on approximately, if we had a 100% take rate, then that second to the last line would be 22 million, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's, um, I'm going to forget all the exact numbers now, but there's roughly 24,000 homes and businesses, and so it would be 50% of that. So it's roughly 12,000. And, and you know, this is one of those things that that cost goes up as we get more people, but as we get more people, it means the network is getting more, more revenue. And, and so that's that's the type of cost that uh, uh, scales with the number of subscribers that we have. The other costs, um, the first couple, um, are are pretty much fixed costs, um, no matter how many subscribers there are. Sure. You want me to elaborate on what? Uh, I want to phrase this carefully. The, first of all, you're assuming a 50% take rate, which suggests that 50% of, of current Comcast subscribers in the town or, or Verizon or whatever uh, don't choose to take it, they'd rather pay Comcast, but that raises the question of a 55, which might be a $65 million expenditure, will also be followed by a monthly or annual fee to the local network after, after we've done a prop two and a half to pay for it. There'll also be monthly fees to use it. Um much like the exercise equipment in the $9 million senior center. Not, not quite. Um, yeah, there would, there would be a subscribers to the network would end up paying uh, a subscriber fee, that would, like they would for any internet service. We project that that would be a lower fee for better service than what uh, people are currently able to get. Um, the other thing is that the subscriber and installation fee or costs there you know, don't all happen on day one. They happen as people sign up and you know as the network is is growing. Um, one of the things that would be to be determined is you know how is that installation cost paid for? Is it paid for as part of the initial build cost? Is it paid partially in terms of um, through subscriber fees and so forth. Um, and, and, and I would urge you not to jump to the idea that this all is going to be paid by a two and a half override. We don't know that. And, and the expectation is that this network will be paid for out of a combination of uh, state or federal grant money, um, subscriber fees as, as things grow, uh, potentially some private funding, and then perhaps some town funding at all. Um, we, we actually, as FalmouthNet, don't expect that the town will be asked to pay for the entire cost of this build. Could I just ask one other question and then surrender the, the mic? The, um, the, you've talk, we've talked about risk in terms of price, our in terms of uh, build-out costs. But how about obsolescence risk? Could you just address that? It never came up. Because I, the, the minimal research I've done, um, having extricated myself from this uh, discipline years ago, uh, is that what you're not ta now talking about remotes, in essence, the, uh, the blue squares on your build-out, could five years from now be the equivalent of a, of a community router where you wouldn't even need the fiber going into neighborhoods. 
but I, I'm just throwing that out there as a, a futuristic hypothetical. Right. How, what is the obsolescence factor in such a construction? Well, fiber has so far proved to be highly resistant to any sort of obsolescence. I mean, there's f uh, fiber that I've built networks over that was originally built to run at 10 megabits per second that today is running at over 100 gigabits per second. That's a huge range. And we expect that to continue. When we first started talking about this, the GPON, the one gigabit service, was m the most likely one. It was the most cost effective. But in those couple of years, it's changed to where this XGS pond, the 10 gigabit service, is cost competitive, as, as, as you can see there. Um, we know that uh, the companies that build this stuff are already talking about um, 40 and even 100 gigabit services as replacement. And one of the real advantages of this type of network is that to upgrade the speed, you're only increasing, changing the electronics in those four hubs. You're not having to go and replace amplifiers and repeaters and so forth all along the way. Uh, and if home wants to take and take advantage of the higher speed, then they would have to replace the electronics in their home, but that's going to be $100, $200, something like that. Um, and if they don't need to, they don't, they don't have to. Um, this type of network can um, operate with different generations of electronics and different, different generations of speeds um, all at one time. So the upgrades happen as there is customer demand for it. up and down Maple Street, up and down Oak Street, up and down Spruce Street, is always going to be necessary. There's, there's no technology on the horizon that would have more head-end type configuration. There, there is nothing that we know of at this time. I mean, people talk, and I know you, you've advocated for, fi for 5G and some of the wireless technologies. And, you know, they're possible in some areas. Um, but there's also large parts of Falmouth which they have, it's difficult to reach the homes. And when you talk about high-speed 5G, which is when people talk about it competing with fiber, you're talking about an active piece of electronics on basically every other telephone pole. Each one of those is a potential, uh, needs power and is a potential spot of failure, which is something that this type of network uh, really avoids. Correct. May I, yeah. may I add one thing? Uh, just to summarize, 80% of the cost of this network is the fiber, the actual fiber on the poles and the construction of the fiber on the poles and the fiber underground. 80% of it, 80%, that 80% is projected to last decades and support constantly increasing speeds. I think that's what Art was trying to say, but to summarize, that's the picture. The 20%, yes, will need upgrades at, uh, on a periodic basis to keep even with the projected increase in the use of our network. So as president of Fiber Up, of, of Fiber, Falmouth, then I want to project my executive authority. This young lady has been very patient and needs to ask uh, a question. Oh, okay, well, just one second. I wanted to add one other thing, is, is that I, I do a lot of audits of fiber optic networks all around the places, and I talk to a lot of general managers, owners of companies, and so on and so on. When these companies move their networks onto fiber and off of copper, they're seeing at a pretty aggressive rate about 85% of their service calls go away. The next 10% of their service calls are basically customer ed something at, at their residence, you know, their Wi-Fi isn't working or something, that, you know, they've got to reboot their computer. The last 5% is they actually have to run a truck. So it, it, they are very uh, stable networks, they're very fast, uh, and they have a long life expectancy. As long as you maintain them, they'll last a long time. You're on. I just want to ask, uh, to clarify, this is strictly going to be um, 
internet access is not going to include telephony. We're all going to have to go get our phones hooked up by some other um, provider. You, you could get phone service over the fiber. Are you guys going to offer that? Well, yeah, Chris, you need to. Um, tele telephony can travel over the fiber without any problem, but unless the city wanted to become a local exchange carrier, um, they would have to subscribe to a service like net to phone or something similar to that um, that, that came over the, over the fiber network. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Can you just speak to the speed um, that you've presented with, I think you said, you know, two and a half gigs up to 10 gigs, and <clears throat> compared to what we have today, and why we need speeds like that for the future? Like, what types of things are we going to be using these speeds for, and why it's important? Scott, you want to jump on that one? Sure. Um, uh, so, just to back up a little bit and talk about the speeds. So what he was comparing between the one gig, one gigabit per second and the 10 gigabit per second was the difference in um, the two technologies, the GPON technology, which is an, an older technology and is starting to sunset, and the XGS uh, PON technology, which is the, the newer replacement of that. And the XGS PON has uh, four times the downstream bandwidth and, and about 10 times the upstream bandwidth uh, over the, the G PON. Now, keep in mind that that 10 gigabits is, is servicing some number of subscribers. Uh, as as um, Chris pointed out, it could be 32 subscribers, it could be 64, it could be 128, although we never recommend that. We don't recommend going above one, um, 64 um, per, per um, splitter. Uh, so um, everybody, the, the 32 subscribers would be utilizing some portion of that 10 gigabit. And, and um, it actually works out a little bit better than that because no Typically, no two people are going to be pulling data at the same time, so you get some um, improvement um, as, as far as it's not just um, 10 gigabits divided by 32. It's, it's, um, it's actually better than that. So um, as far as, as what services are coming down the pipe that you would use that bandwidth, first off, the average bandwidth user now um, in, in the home uh, for anybody that gets uh, cable modems is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 to 250 megabits a second. <clears throat> um, the, the overwhelming majority of that bandwidth right now is used for video. Um, with a, a service like this, if you want to subscribe to YouTube TV, which is an alternative to your local cable provider, um, that has just as many channels, if not more. It has DVR, it has all those services. You can go out and, and subscribe to that. If you want to only subscribe to uh, a couple of channels directly with those channels, you can do that. So you can run uh, video over it. You can go out and subscribe to those video services. And that's one of the largest um, uses for high-speed data today. Um, other services that are coming down the pike um, uh, include really um, everything or a, a myriad of devices within the home being connected for energy management, for usage management, for monitoring. Um, that's, um, that is called smart cities um, applications and uh, they are really starting to take off uh, across the country. Um, the uh, um, energy management is probably the number one driver of that at this point, uh, but convenience is, is another piece of that. Um, really, almost anything that you can think of that is using telecommunications today will probably um, uh, be enhanced 
um, over the next uh, you know 20, 30 years um, and and utilize more bandwidth. Um, and you know I've seen projections that the average homeowner uh, is easily going to use uh, a couple of gigabits a second uh, on a regular basis uh, over the next couple of years. Um, I've seen them uh, projecting out that ultimately um, you'll want to have 10 gigabits uh, to, to the home um, in the in the long range uh, future. Um, it's it's really bandwidth has typically in a network bandwidth grows um, at about a, um, uh, a 20 to anywhere between a 20 and a 40 percent compounded annual rate. So um, I've been in the business for a very, very long time, longer than I want to admit. Um, and I've run a lot of systems. And uh, I can remember uh, 20 years ago when we started doing this, our, our, our whole subscriber base would maybe use one gigabit. Um, and now that same subscriber base is probably using somewhere between 15 and 20 gigabits a second uh, during peak periods. So um, band, the need for bandwidth will be there. It's there now and it will be there in the future. I just, I I just want to okay. make the point that it's not <clears throat> some um, far in the future need for bandwidth that we actually have needs now. Um, I just want to remind folks that a lot of people don't know the difference between 200 megabytes per second and a gig, but there's a big difference. And there's a big difference between up speed and down speed. And in Falmouth, I don't even know that we have 10 megabytes per second upload speed. And we need that. We need that for Zoom meetings, for online school. We're sorely in the need for that. If you want to have a security system in your house, if you want to have remote cameras to check on mom who's living alone, these are all the things that, quote unquote, smart cities, it's smart cities is now. Your Nest device is now. Your camera for mom is now. And these are all the reasons that we need the bandwidth. The other thing I wanted to ask while I have this is, can you speak to the reliability with weather? Because I know that's an issue in Falmouth. I mean, the like, reliability, I'm sorry, the reliability what? With weather. With respect to weather. Uh, but first, sure. could I just add one thing about the upstream bandwidth? Because I think, uh, try to make it a little bit real, because certainly the, the video applications and so forth are there, but um, more and more people are doing backups to the cloud, right? And that is a very intensive upload type activity. Um, and you probably have noticed that if you're doing this, it takes a long time to, to back up your computer. Um, and, and it's something that everybody should be doing. Another way of, you may have noticed it is that, have you ever gotten an email with a bunch of photographs attached to it? And notice that, you know, you can open it up and you can see the pictures pretty, pretty, pretty quickly, depending upon your connection. Um, and that's because you got a lot, a lot of down, download speed. Now, what if you want to share that and send it to your friend or your a family member? You ever notice that it takes forever and ever and ever for that same message that you just got to, to go back? That's because you don't have the upload bandwidth. That's also, the lack of upload bandwidth is also the place where the current networks really fall down on a neighborhood basis because they just don't have it. I'm sorry, I just, I just wanted to, to throw a couple of those examples in. Scott, can you go talk about the uh, liability and weather? Sure. Um, I think you'll, you will find that a fiber optic network is the most reliable network. If it's, if it's engineered and constructed properly, um, it, it, um, by, by its nature, it's not prone to the same um, uh, effects uh, from um, uh, any anything from um, uh, from water migration uh, all the way through lightning strikes. It's just um, it, there's there's no metallic um, c component uh, to the uh, to the cabling. It's glass, so it doesn't um, uh, it it doesn't uh, pass uh, electricity um, and it doesn't attract lightning. Um, the uh, electronics are very limited. 
and as uh, as Chris pointed out, they they would be constructed in a redundant fashion, uh, a, a ring fashion, so that um, if if a um, uh, one of the cabinets happened to um, take a lightning strike, which is very very unusual, but if it did, hypothetically. Um, the other cabinets would stay up and running and they wouldn't lose connectivity uh, back to the internet because their connections have an alternative connection uh, back to the internet, uh, a redundant connection, um, which means that um, any outage would be very isolated to just the one cabinet and not the rest of the town. So uh, from an overall uh, performance and reliability standpoint, um, uh, it's, it's far superior to um, uh, cable television, broadband cable, uh, uh, coax systems. Um, I came out of that industry. I spent uh, 40 years in the cable industry. Um, and um, I, I also, uh, for the last 10 years of my existence in that industry, I uh, um, started to construct and um, operate fiber to the premise. And the fiber to the premise systems um, were far superior. Um, trouble call rates were virtually non-existent. Um, operating costs are one tenth of what they are with a with the uh, coaxial system. So it's a it's just a far superior and far more reliable system. Well, it, sometimes even when the poles go down, fiber sometimes still stays up. It all depends. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Doug Brown with the Select Board. I'm just curious if you could share a little bit more about what those four hubs would look like. Is that like a house? Would there be no, generators it, on those? Generally, um, what what they are is usually a little uh, hut. Um, the usually or, or a cat. I, what what we planned on on okay. that network is uh, hardened cabinets. Okay. So it, it would be you know probably four and a half feet high and maybe have a footprint of five feet wide and seven or eight feet long, and it would be set back off the road and would be typically, they're green in color. Um, they're hardened from the elements. Um, they have self-contained air conditioning in them to keep the, the equipment cool. Um, so they're hardly noticeable. And would there be generators uh, with those in case of power outages? There, there could be generators. What, what we expect in here is some battery backup. You could, you could also equip them with um, smaller generators. I think the better solution for the town of Falmouth, though, is um, uh, they would also have uh, be, be monitored in, in a network operations center. Um, and uh, if, uh, if something happened, if the electricity went out to one of the cabinets, the batteries would take over for a period and it would alert uh, the attendants in the network operations center who could call uh, the on-call technician and go out with a portable generator and put it on there. The addition of fixed uh, generators uh, tends to get expensive, not just from an initial capital standpoint, but also from a maintenance standpoint. We have any other questions? Um, can you explain ring technology once more, one more time? Okay. Uh, yeah. There's in the four remotes that would be out there. There's going to be four fibers that are going to go all the way around uh, to go to go east, to go west. And what happens is when the fiber goes around, the signal is going this way. If it takes a hit. These two loop back on themselves, and the signal stays up while this section here is over here getting repaired. Um, so it, it's a self-healing ring. It's really, it's really a fully active, bidirectional active ring because signal would be flowing in, in both directions. Bandwidth would be flowing in both directions. If, if you lost one of those directions, nothing skips a beat. It continues on with the one direction that it has. It's, uh, it just manages that band, it self manages that bandwidth. And if one side goes down, it just ignores that and pulls all the bandwidth from the other side. And the capacity of those links 
would be more than sufficient to handle 100% of the traffic um, it, um, when and if it needs to. Just note that the, the Open Cape network is, is a fiber optic network built on ring technology. And uh, that happens. You know, we've, if uh, fiber gets cut, you know, car, cars like to hit poles for some reason. And, and, but the interesting thing, and one of your questions about, you know, when a pole goes down, um, we have never, Open Cape in its 15 years now, has never, as far as I know, had a fiber cut due to um, an accident, a car accident, or due to a storm. You know, poles go down during the hurricanes and so forth. The fiber can be lying on the ground, but it's still, it's still working. We've had more issues with things like fires and transformers on poles, squirrels chewing things, stuff like that. So the good news is the wire's going on the side of the poles, so we don't have to worry about our lovely osprey at the top. So that's good news. Um, gentleman back here mentioned, and I think you mentioned, maybe fixed wireless access. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, you all are considering that in maybe environmentally sensitive areas where something may have to go underground or poles have to be replaced, um, would that last 100 feet, is that a consideration? using like a fixed wireless ac access and what I'm talking about is having the uh, electronics as Mr. Gaylord pointed out earlier on the telephone pole and wirelessly going to your house which is what Verizon and T-Mobile are all hyped up about and they just spent billions of dollars on additional spectrum to roll out their sort of cable type product out there but would that be considered in environmentally sensitive areas with Falmouth Net or I'm sorry the town would they consider that? Um, you'd have to look at the uh, engineering and the environmental case for that. I do know that some of the manufacturers um, are now starting to provide electronics that can do um, both the 5G, uh, I'm not sure of all the details, and a GPON type. So some mixing might be possible. I would think it would be extremely limited use, but you know, uh, y you never know. <laughs> I think, but part of that would be, you know, if this is a, a network which is being, you know, designed.